So we're continuing the uh, series looking at a part of the Old Testament that many uh, Christians find really strange, a part often they don't look at. It's the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you're in the teaching for the first time, you might want to hunt for Ecclesiastes. Uh, if you don't know where it is, I do recommend the index because it's quite a small book and you can spend ages going backwards and forwards. And we're starting today at chapter 7 and verse 5 is where we're going to in a moment. Chapter 7 and verse 5. Fantastic. What I enjoy about Ecclesiastes, it's a book that asks the awkward questions. It's a book that asks the tough questions. The questions about life that are there anyway... But it asks those questions. Somebody said to me this last week, came up to me and said, Pastor, I just want to, I want to thank you for this teaching on Ecclesiastes. I said, oh, thank you. He said, I don't like it. <laughs> it really makes me uncomfortable. But actually, I need tough food. So... Uh, I thought, well, that's a, like a mixed sort of thing there. So there we go. So it, its themes include looking at how frail and fragile human life is and therefore how important it is to seize the day. We, we, we live in our culture and society as though we're going to live forever. But in fact, that's just not the case. I was talking to someone this week, I don't actually remember which conversation it was, so if you're in the room at the moment, I apologise, I don't actually, oh yes, I just remembered who it was, so I do apologise anyway, because you are here. Um, they talked to me how they talked to someone one day, and they're making some arrangements for, for what that person was going to do, and two days later, their partner phoned to say that that person had just dropped dead, and they're, I think, only in their 40s. You never know. Life is fragile. And we need to be people that seize the day. And as we've seen as we've gone through, um, the whole subject of, of death and the fact that we're going to die and that this, is, this life is actually relatively short is something that's an embarrassment in our society that we, people try and ignore and, and pretend is not there. But this book... Ecclesiastes looks at that straight in the face. And this morning we're going to look at some of the difficulties of life as well and explore some of those things together. So two weeks ago we did the last section of Ecclesiastes. Who was here two weeks ago? I was here because I was teaching. Some of you were here. Some of you don't know whether you were here or not. So what are some of the key things that we saw last time when we looked at this two weeks ago? Can you remember? What were some of the key things that we looked at last time? Good, I'm so glad you were here last time. Dennis makes notes. No, Teresa, she's shy, so I'm going to say it. Uh, wealth does not satisfy. Absolutely correct. That's one of the things I wrote down. Wealth does not satisfy. It's a bit like salt water and thirst. It doesn't satisfy. Very good. What else? There was something about death. I mean, we talk about death every time when we're looking at Ecclesiastes because that's one of the themes of the book. Uh, and some other things as well. Anything else? Dennis, he takes notes. <laughs> There's a clue for you there. Everything we have comes from God. Absolutely correct. Yes, that was one of the other themes last time. Everything that we have comes from God. And there was something else about death as well. Just, um, I wasn't here, but I've just read it says the day of death is better than the day of birth. Yep, so that means, do you want to preach my sin for last time, just to recap? <laughs> what, we were, what we were looking at last time is that facing the reality of our own death helps us live more authentic, more meaningful lives. You, those of you here last time, you will remember the exercise that my mentor set me, which I found really difficult. I didn't do it the first time, and when I came to the next session, he asked me, and I hadn't done it, so I then got on and did it, which was imagining my own funeral. 
and thinking about what I'd like people to say about me at my funeral. Significant people, who are significant to me, thinking about that. And then using that, and I did this exercise much earlier this year, and I've then used that to help me think about my priorities now. Because the things that I want to be significant, the way that I want to be significant in other people's lives, in, in family, in friends, in ministry, isn't going to happen by chance. It's going to happen if I make it happen. So thinking about what's important to me, what really is significant to me. You know, we get, we get pushed around so much. And one of the people that I mentor, I was talking, because I, I have a mentor, but I also mentor a number of pastors uh, and, and other leaders as well. And uh, I was saying to one of them this week, you know, it's, it's so easy for us to get pushed around by what seems to be urgent and we don't get the important done. It's so easy to get pushed around by what seems to be urgent and we don't get the important, the strategic, the significant done. And uh, when we realise just how little time we've actually got, not that we know how little we've got, but we do know that it is little, it actually then focuses us on what we do. So when we look at the reality of our own death, which is why it says that it's more profitable to be in a house of mourning than at a party. Because it then faces us up with, uh, with life. So let's continue. Chapter 7 and uh, verse 5 is where we're going to come in. And today we're going through to chapter 8 and verse 9. So that's where we're going. And the, the title, the overall title for today is The Stupidity of Wickedness. Which is actually a quote from a verse we'll come to later on. The Stupidity of Wickedness of wickedness and we begin with some observations on life chapter 7 verse 5 and 6 it's better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools like the crackling of thorns under the pot so is the laughter of fools this too is meaningless. This section of chapter 7 continues with a string of proverbs. And the proverbs that are there are designed to do something. They explore some of the paradoxes of life, but they do it in this way. The way these proverbs work is they're designed to provoke you to think. They're all just a bit odd. I mean, proverbs are a bit odd. And, and they, they provoke you to think. And when you've thought and reflected you then are able to act in, in this context, a more godly, more authentic, more meaningful way. So it's, you know, given the choice, what would you want? Someone who says wonderful, nice things about you, because they're a fool, or a wise man that says to you, Doug! <laughs> And, and tells you off. Which actually is a more, well, I mean, what you like the most is the nice words. Even though you know the bloke's an idiot, the fact he's saying nice things about you, well, that's nice, isn't it? You'd rather that than someone who's might say something that's true and not so nice. But it is that latter that's much more value for us in life. One of the things that I say to pastors that I mentor is that your role in church is not to be liked. It's nice if people like you, but that's not what you're there for. Your role is actually to be there and to tell the truth. Hmm. That should empty my diary for this week. <laughs> and then you've got this, this, uh, this, this strange thing about thorns. Um, if you think about brambles, perhaps it's the nearest UK equivalent, and uh, I burnt some brambles down the end of my garden a little while ago, and uh, they make a huge amount of noise. They crackle, they pop. It looks spectacular. Great big flames. It looks wonderful. It lasts, yeah, a few seconds. And does it give any heat out? Absolutely none. So having brambles under the pot that you're trying to heat, the cooking pot you're trying to heat, you know, before we had 
time of gas and all of that piped in here, we're talking thousands of years ago, it, it makes a lot of noise. It looks spectacular, but it is of absolutely no value in the process of cooking whatsoever. A fool's laughter is like that. It looks spectacular. It's really noisy, but it actually doesn't make any significant contribution in to life. It is the challenging words that have more benefit. Let me read to you a, a proverb from the book of Proverbs. I'm going to quote a few of them this morning as we go through. So this is Proverbs 17 and verse 10. You don't need to turn to it. It's, it's just a simple proverb. A rebuke impresses a man of discernment. More than a hundred lashes impresses a fool. Take that away and just have a mull on that. Let's read the next few verses of Ecclesiastes 7. Extortion turns a wise man into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of the matter is better than its beginning and patience is better than pride. These are a string of four proverbs. Do not be qu quickly provoked in your spirit for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? It's not wise to ask such questions. <laughs> four warnings here in these four proverbs. So the first one is warning about the fact that power, whether it is financial power or force, tends to undermine integrity. I was reading a uh, history, you, you will know that I'm interested in, in Brazil, and uh, I was reading uh, some history a little while ago, and a number of, I forget how many years ago it was, 15 years ago perhaps, something like that, one of the Pentecostal denominations in Brazil decided that it wanted to try and make an impact in government. And uh, you will know, uh, that there's a huge problem with corruption of senior politicians in Brazil, as in many other countries as well. So they decided that they were going to get pastors elected to the senior governing body uh, in the country of Brazil. So what they did, they approached various political parties and say, if you make this pastor your candidate, we will guarantee he gets elected because we'll tell all our people to vote for him. Now, I'm not saying that's a good, good policy or a bad policy, but it worked. So they got, I think it was around 20 pastors elected in a number of different political parties. And they all went off to Brasilia, which is the uh, place where Parliament sits. What happened was they ended up, at the end of their term dumping virtually all of them because they'd all become corrupted. Why was that? It's partly what this book, book was about because they were taken out of their church context. They were put in a whole different context. Suddenly, I mean, pastors are not wealthy people. Suddenly, they get people offering them phenomenal sums of money in terms for them doing this small favour here, or, or that small favour there. And because they're all in different parties, they also didn't have this sort of lock of, of fellowship together. So they're all isolated on their own, easily, sadly, corrupted. It's the truth of the proverb here. Extortion turns a wise man into a fool. A bribe corrupts the heart. Power tends to undermine integrity. Second one. You know, it takes time to see something through. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. And patience is better than pride. And that's saying it, it's better, uh, you know, people give up sometimes because their pride gets hurt. Their feelings get hurt. And so they give up. And the proverb saying, Actually, the end is better than the beginning. You need to see things through. The third one is fairly obvious. 
a quick temper is foolish. One other proverb for you. Uh, Proverbs 17 and verse 10. Again, you don't need to turn to it. No, that's sorry, that's the wrong one. That's the one I read already. Proverbs 12 and verse 16. A fool shows his annoyance at once. A prudent man overlooks an insult. Quick temper is foolish. Fourth warning. You know, you'd think that this is a new phenomenon, wouldn't you, actually? You know, in the UK, people going on about the good old days when. You think this is something we'd invented. I mean, this is probably 3,000 years ago, two and a half thousand years ago, and it's a problem then as well. Oh, you know, it was so much better in the good old days when. And it's a nonsense because it's foolish to forget that those days had their own problems. And actually, the reason that people do that is to avoid dealing with today. It becomes a, a mechanism for an excuse for not acting correctly now. Oh, when it was whatever. And it's an excuse. It's, it's a way of getting away from dealing with the present. So four proverbs for you. If any of, those, any of these proverbs really resonate for you and you think that is just so relevant to my life, I'd like to encourage you to write it out. You, you might want to... Um, Use it as a screensaver on your laptop. I had a verse God spoke to me about a couple of years ago and for, um, on my previous computer, just recently got a new computer because the other one died, um, I used it as the screensaver. So every time it went into screensave, I saw this, uh, this verse come up and reminded me of what God was saying to me. So, yeah, or you might want to stick it on your fridge or mirror or somewhere else where you look or inside the fridge might be better actually <laughs> just depending what it is verse 11 wisdom like an inheritance is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter but the advantage of knowledge is this Wisdom preserves the life of its possessor. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. When times are bad, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. You know, life is full of twists and turns. And the older you get, the more aware of that you are. The younger you are, you look ahead and you see a nice straight road in front of you. When you get older, you realize that that was actually just an illusion. He just couldn't see the bends. You couldn't see the ups and downs. It all looks straight and it's going like that. That's not how life is. The Bible's really clear that when God made everything, it was? In fact, it was? Very good. But human beings decided that they knew better than God. And part of the consequence of that, of that fall, of that rupture in relationship between uh, God and humans, and humans and creation, and God and creation, is the twists and turns, the crookedness of life. And some of that is God's doing. Some of it is the result of brokenness and sin, but some of it is the result of God's doing. Death, for example. And we can't change the crookedness of life. And if you think you can, you're a fool, in the biblical sense of the term. And you can't even see the twists and turns that are coming. 
I mean, how often, you know, do you look ahead? Doug, you know, you and I, we're, we're, we're a bit older than some of the, we're a bit younger than some of the people, we're a bit older than some of the people here. Um, but, you know, in, in life, you know, you look ahead, you, you, you see the ministry. Doug's a missionary, by the way, for those of you that don't know. You look ahead, you see the ministry, and you think, see, this and this and this. And how often is it that there's something happens as you're going along which you can't possibly see in advance? Is, is that true? Yeah, that's uh, typically true. Maybe 20% of what you think is going to happen is what follows through, and the rest is just very different. And that's how life is. And if you don't accept that, you're a fool. So what do we do with that crookedness of life? Those bends, those twists, those unexpected ups and downs. Well, the writer here says, when it's good, enjoy it. Yeah, why not? Jesus said, did he come to bring life and life to the full? So life's for enjoying, amen? And when it's a rubbish thing, an unwelcome thing, a bad thing that comes our way, Okay, you, you don't enjoy it, but you trust God, and you reflect on life. You know, there's, um, I think it was William Cowper wrote the song, that the first, hymn, the first line is, God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. And uh, there's so much truth in that. Because there's so much that God is up to that actually, at the time, we can't see. It's been my experience, and I've been a Christian now for, it's about 45, nearly 45 years. I think, 45, 44, 45 years, I'd, I'd have to um, get a bit of paper and work it out. But it's something like that. And it, it, it's been my experience that, in my life, God has done far more behind my back than in front of my face. And actually, I'm quite pleased he's done it that way around a lot of the time. And so it's trusting God in those bits that are unexpected and unwelcome. Verse 15. In this meaningless life of mine says the writer i've seen both of these a righteous man perishing in his righteousness a wicked man living long in his wickedness so do not be over righteous neither be over wise why destroy yourself do not be over wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It's good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. Wisdom makes one man more one wise man more powerful than ten rulers in a city. There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you, for you know in your heart that many times you have cursed others. Again, a whole series of proverbs here, which don't necessarily flow and build one on the other. And it begins with some human logic, which goes a bit like this. Let's have a mix of uh, a bit of good, Bit of evil, why not? And a bit of religion thrown in just to cover all the bases. Deal with the risks. But then he goes on in the next Proverbs to remind us that no one is perfect. Everyone has done wrong in God's sight. Particularly in the area of speech. And he says, therefore... Don't take it too seriously when people say bad things about you. Just remember, Rangina, that you've thought bad things about other people. She said quite true, very quietly then, by the way. <laughs> I 
And it's easy, isn't it? You, you, you hear over here or you have reported back to you some comment that somebody's made about you and you, you, you take it incredibly personally as though it, it's the most significant thing in the entire universe. Forgetting that actually you were thinking something bad about them yesterday. I see an awful lot of smiles and nods in the room. So the writer says, just, you know, don't take it too seriously. But one thing we do need to take seriously in this is his comment here, which of course is picked up in the New Testament, that no one does right all the time. Everyone falls short of God's standard. And the Bible makes that very clear that the consequences of that New Testament times is separation from God unless we ask God to forgive us. We confess our sins to God and we ask God to forgive us and receive that forgiveness that's available because of Jesus' death on the cross. So, so let's think back over this chapter. Let's pause for a moment before we come to this uh, the last section of chapter 7, which is uh, quite difficult. Think back over what we've seen so far this morning. And I think of the different proverbs that are there and some that have resonated with you and some that you've thought are just frankly weird. Um, and think about your life. Think about our society, our context that we live in. And I wonder what things just come to the surface from here that... that you look and apply into our contemporary situations at the moment. What jumps out for you? I was just thinking about uh, the use of the internet. Sometimes it can be a power for good, but sometimes it can be a power for horrible things. So we should be very careful about what we say on the internet. Once it's out there, it's out there. Very good. Um, as um, a church, um, you know, when you look at... Um, uh, Parliament, um, the House of Commons, and the debates that go on there, and people are, um, you know, on different sides of the fence, different political parties, and their debates are, are you know, robust, let's say, some of the time, um, but those people, each side of those, uh, they're, they're convinced of, in their hearts, we must assume, that their, their way is the right way and the good way. But, you know, outside of that, you know, in the bar and on the terraces, those people behave civilly. And I think in a, ch in a church, and particularly uh, where that's important, is a church meeting when there are um, things to be talked about. Well, you, I don't think that you should... Um, I think you should, people, we should participate. That's why we're here at a church meeting, not just to be talked to. Um, and we trust that we're under the influence of God's spirit. And even if your, what you, uh, your view isn't the same as what's being said by others, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. So you don't have to keep quiet. That's how, in a church meeting, we can discern what God is saying. You, don't, you might have your idea of, you know, the way forward when you come in or what we're discussing, but to be open in that, to be changed your mind. So, you know, we can learn <laughs> from what goes on in the House of Commons and just be civil to one another and be open to what God says. But, yeah. Was there a particular one of those proverbs that prompted that, Carol, for you? Uh, well, when, when you say, like... You know, difficulties come by what people say. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Uh, what, wait, wait, wait till I've got here. Okay, okay. And the proverb that came to me just now is sort of two together, is don't be provoked 
um, quickly, my anger, as well as when you're speaking things, uh, um, think about what you're saying before you speak. Uh, so I was going to say that, and then she came up with the example, which was very true, because sometimes very quickly we tend to respond uh, to something we've heard, and maybe we haven't heard it correctly and responding badly. Thank you very much. Whether the circumstances seem good or evil, God's still in charge. Amen. Amen? Amen. Anything else? Okay, let's move on to this next uh, rather depressing um, section from verse 23 down to verse uh, 29, which is a sort of conclusion to this, to this section. Um, all this I tested by wisdom, and I said, I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Whatever wisdom may be, it is far off and most profound. Who can discover it? So I turned my mind to understand, to investigate and to search out wisdom and the scheme of things and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap, whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God would escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. We're going to come back to that in a moment, ladies, so don't throw anything at me yet. <laughs> Look, says the teacher, this is what I've discovered. Adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things while I was still searching, but not finding I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. Just hold back the throwing things for a moment. <laughs> this only have I found. God made man upright, but men have gone in search of many schemes. It's a bit of a depressing conclusion part way through. There is a much better, uh, a less depressing conclusion we're going to get to when we get to the end of Ecclesiastes. But this is a, uh, and it includes a pretty negative view of women, which I'll come back to in a moment. Please don't throw anything yet. He's stating here that in, in human strength, even the wisest can't figure life out. And that's partly how God, because that's how God has made it. If you could figure it all out, clever people, would we need faith? If we could figure it all out, would we realise that actually we're dependent on God or would we think, oh, we're clever? It's part of how God has made the world so that we have to come to a place well, we have a choice of coming to a place of trust in God. He observes that God made people good and to have relationship with him, but humans have chosen to go their own way in search of many schemes. And in fact, wisdom, he says here, can become just one of those schemes. Trying to think your way through, trying to work it all out. And he said, David Wise paraphrase, my brain hurts. I've tried to work it all out. And no matter how much I try and work it all out, I can't. And if we think we can, it then becomes yet another scheme, another human scheme that's there instead of trust in God. Now, let's talk about these comments about women here. He's writing in the context of a very chauvinist, um, patriarchal society. The, the reference to a woman is a snare, is a reference to someone who entices others into sex outside of marriage. That's the context. And you could look at this and think, this writer has got a really negative view of women. 
And you'd be partly true in that, but it's not the whole truth. Because in Ecclesiastes, what does he picture wisdom as being? A woman. Hmm. So it's not, I don't want you to hear and go away and think, oh, this is entirely, uh, this guy's got a real problem with women. He, he's reflecting some of the values of society and the way that power was set up in society in those days. Because in that context, because men were in power, uh, very, very much in all sorts of society relationships, they didn't have to entice women into anything. They just took what they wanted. Men, in that, in that context, because men were in power in society, in every relationship. So they just took what they wanted. And so the only snare that he sees in this context, in that society, in the way he's talking about here, is women. Because men didn't operate in that sort of way. Their evil was different in that society. So looking at this section here, verses 23 to 29, what, uh, what lessons are there to take away for us today? Look at that before we come on to the final section we're going to look at this morning. First nine verses of chapter eight, which is where we're going to finish. So looking at this rather depressing conclusion, interim conclusion, he comes to here. What, uh, what things do we take away? other than being depressed. It looks to me like you're about to speak, Doug, so I'll rush over with a mic. <laughs> well, one thing I get is that some things really are just beyond our understanding, and there's, there's no reason to fuss, fuss and mess about with them. They, they, they're right now not things that we understand. Now, sometimes people say to me, in, in this context, by the way, this is just a, just a side digression here. They say, of course, we'll, you know, we'll find out all those answers when we get to heaven. I have a theory that when we get to heaven, we're not going to be bothered. I just thought, just thought I'd throw that in. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be too caught up with God to really be bothered about that. But I, I just throw that in as a side issue. The one, thing, the one thing I get from all this is to trust in the Lord, to know that he's got it, and that we may, we'll never understand 95% of what's going on, but keeping faith in the Lord, knowing that he's at work, and it'll all come clear in your hand. When we, be, when we become frustrated with situations, that's when chaos ensues, and we take the temptation of becoming frustrated, that's only a temptation. The, the only power that the devil has got is to tempt us to do things. If we trust in the Lord, then we can stay calm, know he's got it, and all come good in the end. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, let's look at this last, uh, last chapter, and I'm going to take a slight digression with this as well, because oh, we'll see when we get there. Chapter 8 uh, begins, uh, Who is like the wise man? Who knows the explanation of things? Wisdom brightens a man's face and changes its hard appearance. Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since a king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? Whoever obeys his command will come to no harm. And the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a man's misery weighs heavily upon him. This passage here is about how to deal in the context of autocratic government. Uh, I know that in this uh, country, UK, we have a democracy. We, uh, every five years or so we elect our government, and if we don't like our government at the end of the five years, we can elect a different government. We have that, that privilege, that right here. So we're not in, in the sense of autocratic government, but in many parts of the world, they're dealing with government like this, the 
leader may not be called a king, he may be called a president, uh, or whatever term might be used. But the king in Israel had seemingly unlimited power. There was no high court, there was no judiciary. Uh, there were prophets, but they had no legal standing. The king seemed to have unlimited power. And the writer took the view that, therefore, the wise way forward was compliance and discretion. This was the wise choice. The wise should keep quiet until an appropriate time, which, of course, could be really frustrating because the misery weighs heavily upon him. I just want to digress around this for a moment. This issue of how Christians should respond to unjust government because many Christians in our world today are sitting in the context of an unjust government. So there is this question about how Christians should respond. It's a big issue and I'm not going to um, go into it in all the detail that we could do because we would be here for the rest of the afternoon. But I, I want to just give a simple response. There's, there's two strands in the New Testament that we need to listen to both strands here. And I'm just going to read three short passages, each of three verses. So the first of them is from Romans 13. And uh, this is one of those passages that uh, people in power like to quote. Romans 13, verse 1. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. Stick that alongside uh, this other passage in 1 Peter, which points in a very, very similar direction. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do right and to commend those who do wrong. For it's God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Now all of that is true and is a part of God's will and God's purpose. Our instinct as Christians in whatever country or context we're in is to obey our Christian instinct is to obey the governing authorities the rulers whether we like them or not whether we agree with them or not whether we think they're doing God's will or not our fundamental direction should be of submission to the governing authorities corrupt or not good or not that's the teaching of scripture there are limits to that which we're going to come to in a moment. There have been times in history when terribly corrupt so-called Christian leaders, political leaders, have used passages like this to justify what's been not far short of genocide. So there are limits to this and those limits you can see also in the New Testament. <coughs> Here's one very, very clear example Acts chapter 5, verse 27 to 29. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin, highest court to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter 
And the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. Ultimately, our submission as Christians is to the living God. And when there is a direct contradiction between what those in authority, whatever context we are in, are telling us to do, and God's will, and we're clear that that's not our personal preference, it's not because we don't like it, but it's clear that this is against God's will. Christians, in my observation, have been rather quick to put their own views as being God's views. In that context, the right thing that we do is we disobey and accept the consequences of that, as Peter and John did, as Paul did. Whatever that consequences are, which often in many autocratic situations is death. There have been more Christians killed for their faith. Uh, there are currently being more Christians killed for their faith each year than any other period in world history. Let me just say that again. There are currently being more Christians killed for their faith per year than any other period in world history. Not just in terms of sheer numbers, but in terms of proportion of the population. Because you could say to me, well, there are more people alive today, David, than ever been before. Yeah, that's true. But just proportionally as well. Because for a Christian, as Ecclesiastes makes very clear, death is not necessarily a disaster. Because we only have a pretty short life. And we're going to die anyway. So dying sooner because of obedience to God and disobedience to an authority that is opposing God is not a disaster. Huge area there. Maybe you might ask Warren to explore it on one of his theological exploration evenings, if that's of interest to you more, to uh, unpack that uh, wider because it's, uh, it's a huge area. Enough of that digression. Let's go back to the final three verses of Ecclesiastes that I'm going to look at this morning. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 6. 7, sorry. Since no man knows the future, who can tell him what is to come? No man has power over the wind to contain it. So no one has power over the day of his death. As no one is discharged in time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. Even the most powerful, their power might seem to be unlimited. But the reality is, it is limited. They cannot control, even predict, let alone prevent their own death. And if they are wicked, they are a captive to their own wickedness. When I, many, many years ago, was preparing to travel to uh, South Africa on sabbatical, um, one of the things that I remember reading, that, that I, when I first read it, I, um, it, I, it just jarred with my thinking. And it was about the... So at the time when I was going, um, Mandela had just been released from prison, but black people still were not allowed to have the vote. It was still, um, whilst apartheid had been legally, officially abolished, it was in your face <laughs> wherever, you, wherever you went in the country. And, and in some of the stuff I was reading, which was written by, often by, um, by black writers, they were talking about white people needing to be set free from their racism. For their own sakes. Not, not about for the sake of the people who they were oppressing, but for their own sake. This is Christian black writers writing. And, and their argument 
which I didn't get my head around at first, was that actually the wickedness that they were practicing was as much oppressing them as people as the people that they were oppressing. And it wasn't until when I was in South Africa, I, I, I'm not going to unpack, I don't have to unpack the conversations here, but I, I remember two particularly significant conversations with, with people who had been, I remember one in my mind at the moment, he had been the chaplain to the apartheid government. So he sat at cabinet. He was a white guy. Uh, Bayes Naude was his name. And he was the chaplain to the apartheid government. So he, he came in and he led prayers at every cabinet meeting. And he came to believe that apartheid was evil. And uh, there was a process for that for him, which I, which I don't have time to unpack now. And he ended up being a banned person in South Africa, which meant that he went from being uh, a very highly influential person to disappearing. He was not allowed to be with more than two people at any one time. And that's how he stayed for many, many years until that whole regime was, uh, was swept away. But he saw that he actually had been oppressed by his own wickedness. And he talked about how the process of him being set free. And it, and it suddenly opened my eyes to understand what this verse and others like it are talking about. As no one is discharged in time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. We talk about in the New Testament, don't we, about people being slaves of sin? And it's only the power of Jesus that sets people free. And we sometimes look at the wicked and we think that life is fantastic for them and we forget that they actually are captive. They are slaves to their own wickedness. Our time has gone. I'm going to pray for us in a moment. Well, let's stand actually. Let's stand and let's be quiet before God for a moment. I've talked for quite some time. Let's give a few minutes to allow you to make your own response to God in the quiet. Uh, I'm going to lead us in prayer in a few moments. Father God, we recognize that life's path for us has many twists and turns that we we cannot predict. We can look back and see them, but we can't see them coming. Father, help us to be people who really enjoy the good. Who celebrate life and enjoy life. And also those who prayerfully reflect in the not so good, the bad, the difficult times. Help us to be wise in the way that we live our lives. Father, as we think and reflect on your word, we ask that it will take root in our lives and will help us to live in a way that brings glory and honour to you and meaning and significance to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.